Hello, we're going to continue our discussion about electromagnetic radiation. While I prefer to do these in class, circumstances such as they are, I require this to be a virtual lecture, but one of the reasons I don't like doing virtual lectures is because I feel like we miss the back and forth and you asking good questions. So please, if you have questions, write them down and ask me about them in our next class session. So this picture shows the electromagnetic spectrum. I really like this picture because it gives you some idea of what these sizes mean. So if you look at this, here shows the name of the wave, radio waves to microwaves, infrared, visible light. See how this is this tiny, tiny little section? Ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Then it gives you the wavelength. And you can see that this is long wavelength all the way to smaller wavelength. But these numbers don't really mean anything to me at least. So this shows you that you know this wavelength, 100 meters, is about a football field. And then so the wavelength of one radio wave is a football field. And the microwaves, you know, that you go to the size of a human, to a bee, to a pinhead, we're getting pretty small. These order of magnitudes are pretty huge. To a cell, bacteria, and then on the other side of visible light, the uh, width of a virus. And then x-rays are the size of an atom, and then the size of a nuclei. So I like this because it gives you some idea. Now radio waves and microwaves are commonly used for communication. We'll just kind of put them both there. And while I don't expect you to draw this in your notes, you might make yourself some comments here. Infrared is what we would commonly call heat. And then as we get over here, you get the what in your head is probably the dangerous types of, of radiation. Ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays. Gamma rays are dangerous enough that we use them to kill cells purposely. That's what gamma knife is. So this end has low wavelength, or small wavelength is a better way to say that. But high frequency because they're inversely proportional according to the equation we've learned, and high energy. So higher frequency is higher energy. And we talked about these terms last week when we talked about sound. Infrared means below red on the visible spectrum. Ultraviolet means above violet. So I use this to remember Ultraviolet is more dangerous and higher energy and higher frequency than infrared because one you're exposed to all the time, infrared lights at a fast food, and one you try to limit your exposure to. So that helps me remember that red is on the low energy, long wavelength, um, low frequency end, and violet is on the upper end. Because I would expect you to be able to at least tell me general like range maybe lowest to highest energy and just have an idea of like if I said which was the highest energy of these options or the most dangerous or the smallest wavelength that you have a general idea I wouldn't expect you to give me numbers so we need to talk a little bit about how light is produced you should have covered this in chemistry but we'll review it really quickly if you remember when you did your flame test stuff where you burnt the chemical and it made different colors uh, this was part of how we knew energy was quantized. It was, it was a big deal when we you know, first came out with this. But the idea is that when an atom gets energy to it, it absorbs it. The electrons are in the resting, or what we call the ground state. And the energy causes the electron to jump up and be excited. And then, but it's not sustainable. So when the electron falls back down, it releases that energy as photons or, you know, packets of light. So let's write that down. So energy 
causes electrons. to jump to a higher energy level. We we call excited. Then, when electrons return to ground state, which is that original state, the energy is released as photons. which is a packet of energy, right? And the awesome thing about this, and that proved that energy was quantized, was that every element creates its own bands of color because the electrons are different, and when it falls different energy levels, it releases sets amounts. There's a couple of different examples of how light is produced that you'll see in your everyday life. We have neon lights and those were similar to, you may have seen the the tubes where there was like neon and argon and other noble gases in them and it ran electricity through them and produced a light. So the gas atoms get excited by the electrical current and release light. It's almost exactly what we just talked about. So gas atoms are excited by electrical current. So really the only difference in how these the light is produced is where the energy comes from. Now they're fast becoming things of the past, but we have incandescent bulbs. This one's slightly different. Incandescent usually means that it glows when it's hot. So inside an incandescent bulb is this little filament right here. And if you look at one that's clear, you can see the little thin wire and it has high resistance. So it gets hot really fast when electricity runs through it. And it's of a particular type of uh, metal, usually tungsten, I think, that glows when it's hot. That's why they say they burn out because eventually they get hot enough that it melts and it breaks the, the circuit. So filament glows when it heats up. And fluorescent bulbs. Um, inside of a fluorescent bulb is a gas, but it's not glowing because of electrical current. What happens is there is an electrical current coming through it, and there is a gas that emits light, but it's not visible. It emits a UV light, just the lowest energy kind, so it's not super dangerous. And the coating on the inside of the bulb glows when it absorbs the UV light and releases visible. So it's kind of like a converter from the UV light to the visible light. Gas is excited and emits UV. And the coating on the inside absorbs that UV and emits visible light. This is why older fluorescent light bulbs usually took a second to kick in because this process 
took a little bit to happen. Just got a quick minute physics video here. Light bulbs used to be simple. Just run a bunch of electrical current through a thin wire until it heats up enough to start glowing. Bare filament electric lamps were first demonstrated around 1800 by Humphrey Davy, and the glass bulb was added later to keep oxygen away from the wire so it could glow for a long time without actually burning up. So the incandescent light bulb is 19th century technology, and by now there's a blinding array of electric lamps. Halogen light bulbs, fluorescents, mercury and sodium vapor lamps, LEDs, and so on. Each one makes its own clever use of physics to achieve the life goal of a light bulb, converting electrical current into visible light. Here's how they work. Halogen bulbs have the same tungsten metal filament as typical incandescent light bulbs, but they contain a little bit of a halogen-based gas in the bulb as well. The chemistry of the halogen gas allows it to capture stray tungsten atoms that evaporated off the filament and shepherd them back to where they belong, which both prolongs the life of the filament as well as keeps the inside of the bulb clean and clear. Fluorescent bulbs are basically gas-filled tubes with electrodes at both ends. Electrical current flows from one electrode to the other, and when the electrons that make up the current bump into mercury atoms in the gas, the energy of the collision makes the atoms get excited. That's the technical term. And the atoms then emit visible and ultraviolet light. The white coating on the inside of the glass absorbs the ultraviolet light and re-emits it as more visible light. This process is called fluorescence and is the namesake of the bulbs. Because the coating stops the UV light, it also keeps the bulbs from giving you cancer, unless that's what you want, in which case you use a tanning bulb with a different kind of coating. Sodium, mercury, and metal halide vapor lamps, which are commonly used for lighting streets, warehouses, gymnasiums, and other large areas, are also tubes that run electrical current through a gas. The gas itself emits mainly visible light, so these bulbs don't need a fluorescent coating. Finally, LEDs are also like fluorescent light bulbs, except replace the gas with a tiny crystal of semiconducting gallium and throw away the bulb. So, not like fluorescent bulbs. But seriously, the semiconductor has two layers, one of which provides excited electrons with lots of energy, while the other provides a place for the electrons to go and relax. And that is the technical term. All you need is an electrical current to transport electrons from the party side to the spa side, where they release the energy of their excitement as light. Voila, a light-emitting diode. Perfect for human parties. This video is brought to you in... So that's a great overview of a bunch of different types of light emitters. There's a couple of terms for light sources that are commonly used that I want to make sure that you know. Because we don't define them now. I'm not sure when you would have them defined for you. So if something is termed as luminous, that means it produces its own light. And one example of that is um, the sun. It's the, best, the easiest example. Phosphorescent. If you have ever had any glow-in-the-dark stars or toys or whatever um, in your room, they are phosphorescent. They glow after being exposed to light. That's why in the morning, if you, I used to have glow-in-the-dark stars on my ceiling. Um, in the morning when you first wake up, if it's still dark, they're not glowing very brightly because it's been a long time since they've been exposed. But when you very first turn off the light, they're nice and bright. So they're absorbing that energy and releasing it slowly over time. So after being exposed to light. And remember here that light is our term for any electromagnetic radiation, not just visible. So fluorescent, we've kind of talked about already, but they glow while exposed to light. And in most cases it is UV light, but it is still a type of light. And incandescent, we've also defined as glow, uh, things that glow when hot. So a lot of these terms we've already defined, but not specifically in our notes. Bioluminescent, it has the roots of luminous, so we can kind of see it's going to produce its own light. And it's going to be something living, 
so light produced from living things like the picture of this jellyfish here there are some fish that do it um, I looked for some pictures of bioluminescent fish and I honestly couldn't decide which ones were real pictures and which ones were computer generated drawings so I didn't show you any of those and fireflies are another example but we've seen those So please know these terms, have an idea of what they mean. One thing that I think is interesting to see is the wavelengths emitted by the sun. We know that it emits UV and, and most of you probably realize it emits infrared because it warms you and of course visible, but it doesn't produce all things evenly. So this yellow curve here represents the wavelengths emitted by the sun. So it's you know, releasing a little bit of radio and microwaves, a good bit of infrared that keeps us warm. It peaks here in the visible and specifically in this blue green area. And thankfully drops down very, very quickly, so it's not emitting a whole lot of dangerous x rays on us. But this is important to see, and we compare this to the wavelengths emitted by certain kinds of light bulbs, and that's why. Um, like incandescent light bulbs tend to be uh, higher peaked in the yellow as opposed to the green, which is why they look great, yellower. And fluorescent tends to be in the blue, which is why sometimes things don't look the same colors in different lights because they're emitting different wavelengths. And we'll talk more about that soon. There's a couple of different things that can happen when light hits matter. This looks very much like the same list we had earlier about uh, weight ways that waves can interact. We just took off interference because another wave isn't matter. So when light hits matter it can be absorbed and it's usually absorbed as heat. If you wear a black shirt outside you get warm because it's absorbing a lot of heat. Many times several of these are happening at the same time. It's not just one or the other. So it can be absorbed usually as heat. It can be refracted, which means bending when it changes the medium, like the broken pencil. It can be reflected, which means bounced off. And in almost every case, some is absorbed and some is reflected, depending on its energy. And it can also be diffracted, bending around an opening or an obstacle. Light waves don't diffract a lot because of, of their uh, wavelengths. And we'll talk more about that in our next chapter. But this is why when you're walking down a dark hallway, you can hear sound from a room with the door open, but the light doesn't spread out into the hallway. And again, which happens depends on the energy of the wave and the nature of the matter it is hitting. So the absorbing and reflecting has to do with color, um, which is the nature of the matter it's hitting, and a little bit to do with the energy as well. Now we also have special terms for the matter that lights hits. So a lot of vocabulary in today's notes. We can call the matter opaque or translucent or transparent. And again, in this case, we're talking about visible light. I know we've used light to mean all, so I'm defining here as visible. And opaque means that light cannot pass through it. So right here you can see the incident light coming in and it's absorbed, none of it comes through. And I have a little picture here, you can't see anything. 
In translucent, light can pass through, but it's scattered. This makes the image fuzzy looking, like right here. You can still see that it's giraffe, but it's looking a little fuzzy. You can see here, just like this. Um, frosted glass is translucent. You can see through it, light shines through, but it's scattered. And transparent. Light passes through in straight lines. Clear glass, right? It doesn't distort the image any. So transparent and opaque are the extremes of the spectrum. Right? It either does or does not pass through. And translucent is all the middle ground. So it can be more or less translucent, it can be more frosted looking or less, but any distortion and it falls into the translucent category. Let's talk about color really quickly, that way we'll have plenty of time to review things. Color is seen because of the reflected light. So most light holds a little bit of every color. And when it hits an object, based off of that object's properties, some light is absorbed, which means it doesn't bounce back to our eyes, and some is reflected. So, for example, this leaf is green because all the other colors are absorbed and green is reflected. So it absorbs all other colors and reflects only green. And often it's a mixture of colors, which is how you get so many different shades. But it's important to know that white is all the light reflected. And black is technically not a color because it is the absence of any color being reflected. That's why black clothing and black cars get hot faster because they're absorbing all that light. And we can make colors in two different ways. We can do additive color mixing, which we have three primary colors of light. It's like if we were shining spotlights. If we shone a blue one and a green one and a red one, where they all overlapped, we would make white. And we have these uh, secondary colors here as well, the magenta and yellow and cyan, but the three primary colors of light for additive color mixing, that means like adding extra color lights, red, green, and blue, not yellow. Subtractive color mixing is like with pigments. So I paint yellow on a piece of paper, and I paint magenta on a piece of paper, and I paint cyan, or I paint just a circle of yellow, and I mix the paints. Whenever all three of those overlap, you get black. That means everything is being absorbed right here. And then you can see the secondary colors are red, blue, and green, so they are kind of inverses of each other. And I've got a cool um, simulation. These are also linked on your topics page along with everything else, all the other videos we've done. And you can see this is a color addition simulator. So you can turn red on and blue and green. And you can see where they la overlap. Those two overlap to make yellow, these two to make cyan, those two to make magenta, and you can see where they all overlap. You get white, 
and you can kind of play with it, which is why I posted it on your page, and see what changing the amount of each one does. But it's kind of cool to see. So imagine this as being lights that were green and blue and red shown on a stage. So with just these three colors of lights, you could make any color, theoretically. And then for color subtraction, you could imagine this being a paint, and we're mixing paint colors. So if you were a painter, all you would have to buy is cyan, magenta, and yellow, and you could make every color. You can change the amount of yellow, and you can see you're changing these. It could be primarily that one. So you can play with these, which is, again, why I linked them on your page, so that you can look at the different colors and see how they mix. Because especially if any of you are artists, it might be kind of interesting to you. That's all the notes we're going to do today. We will pick up on the next slide tomorrow, or the next time we have class. Not tomorrow. Please let me know if you have questions. Please make sure you take these notes yourself because you are required to submit a photo of them by class on Monday. Thank you.